Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this uh, 12th Coffee with Abad. Uh, as you are probably aware, apart from the regular webinars in respect of uh, serious topics to do with the law, we are also into the practice of doing sessions which are uh, uh, entertaining, informative, and uh, also humorous, so as to ensure that interest is still retained during webinars. And in keeping with that uh, very, very short-lived tradition, today we have uh, a session for you, which will probably be of serious interest to lawyers, especially in Madras. Now, lawyers of uh, olden Madras, as it used to be called, and uh, as many of us still persist in calling it, uh, were all people who had far more interests, passions, and hobbies than just pursuit of the law. Their philanthropists, uh, uh, dramatists, there were musicians, there were educationalists, and there were wonderful sportsmen, both among the bar as well as among the judges. And uh, to talk about that and their contribution, we have uh, today uh, a person who has been uh, a music historian, who has been a chronicler, who incidentally was the secretary of the music academy as well. It's taken hundreds and thousands of people on heritage walks. The editor of the Madras Musings. And uh, if there is any talk show in the city of Madras about the city of Madras, uh, this gentleman is at the forefront of it. He's also a prolific uh, writer and has contributed various articles to, especially the Hindu and has a blog, which I'm hoping that he will let me uh, be tagged on to that blog, etc. So with all these uh, attributes to his name, let me welcome the gentleman who has to be a good man, purely because of the wonderful name Sriram that he possesses. Welcome Sriram. Welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you. So, uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you, Namesake, for having invited me for uh, making this uh, presentation. The, uh, the presentation that I'm going to do concerns a period in the past. It does not deal with lawyers of the present. Uh, I would say that uh, essentially it pertains to a period that dates between, say, roughly between the 1850s and the 1950s. And uh, I, uh, I have drawn a curtain after that because the rest of it becomes contemporary history. And there are so many more other names that can be uh, brought into the picture and can be uh, spoken about. Such a presentation is also very difficult to kind of put together into one timeline because suddenly people will say, what about this person and that person? So it, I can't say it's a comprehensive presentation either. All I can say is that it is a set of top of mind names and their contributions to the cultural influences of our city. And uh, I'll be taking you through it. Sriram mentioned that, uh, you know, they were multifaceted faceted personalities who contributed a lot to other fields. It was also a certain time in the history of the city when uh, they could contribute uh, apart from being uh, very busy lawyers. Uh, I don't think that that... Uh, scenario exists any longer because I think with the given the number of judgments and the number of uh, laws that keep coming out all the time, you have to be fairly focused in your profession if, and continuously read and get to know what is the latest that is happening. And in those days, you could easily go off for two months in summer to Kodaikanal or Kutralam or whatever. You know, there was that famous song in Miss Malini which says, Mailapur Vakila to Matapo Naven. Avani something, Masan Kutralam Poven. So, you know, the two months they would all vanish from the scene and they wouldn't be here. They had enough and more time to 
devote to several pursuits, which I don't think is given to us today. So uh, that was a different era. I'll start with the uh, presentation itself right away. The first slide that I'm showing you has an English lawyer with three uh, Indians uh, standing around him. It's the typical British Raj kind of a painting where the white man is shown to be uh, superior and dispensing justice to three Indians who are crouching in front of him. The white man is John Bruce Norton, J.B. Norton, who was Advocate General Government of Madras. And what he is doing here is he's not pronouncing a judgment. He's on the other hand, solving a case that had been in the high courts of Madras or rather in the court at that time, there was no high court at that time, between 1799 and 1845. It had been going on for 46 years and ultimately every heir to that particular estate had died. There was nobody left and despite that the lawyers were continuing to keep the case going and it had multiplied and there were many other issues involved that were coming out of it. And that was the will of Pachaya Pramudalya. In fact, it is the first instance of the law suddenly manifesting itself in onto the cultural scene of uh, Tamil, of what we call today Tamil Nadu. Uh, J.B. Norton then comes out with a solution where he says that Pachaya Pramudalya has said that certain number of certain amount of his wealth has to go for the establishment of certain religious observances. Now, over and above that, there is plenty of money left in the estate. What do we do with that money? And he said that that money has to go towards education. So in the 1840s, for the first time, the government gets involved, the Advocate General gets involved, and then they create what is called the Pachayapas Trust. And based on that, then comes Pachayapas College and the several charities all over what is Tamil Nadu even today, if you go to various parts of Tamil Nadu, you go to Kanchipuram, you go to Trichy, you go to Chidambaram, you go to Srirangam, uh, uh, so many other places. In fact, right down to Tirunelveli, you have instances of Pachayapas charity in various temples. You will find stone edicts at various places saying that these are all observed as part of the will and the final testament of Pachayapamudalya. And the remnant of that estate was much more than the actual behest. And that is how Pachepa's College comes into existence. Pachepa's College itself has had an enormous influence on the cultural development of what we recognize as Tamil Nadu today. Uh, most of the Justice Party members, you know, the leaders of the non brahmin movement, and therefore the entire battle for social justice, for inclusivity, for social equality, everything begins from the Pachepa's Trust. And so therefore it is it really the law enters the cultural scene of Tamil Nadu with a bang, but you know, in 1845 with the establishment of the Pachayapas Trust. And this portrait is taken to commemorate that occasion. So there is not in the middle, and there are the three trustees who are going to administer this estate of Pachepa along with Norton. One of them is going to write a brilliant book on the life of Pachepa Mudalya, which even today is a remarkable testament of a great man and also how the law can complicate things and finally how decisive intervention can solve matters so it's a it's a wonderful story Pachepa Mudalya, the story of Pachepa's will now around the time that Pachepa's will is being written uh, we have a man in Mailadathurai and his name is Vedanaya Kampile Vedanaya Kampillai, Samuel Vedanaya Kampillai, who, uh, as is evident from the name, he's a Christian. And in the uh, 1870s, he writes the examination for the district Munsif's post. And two other people are also, only three people effectively qualify in that examination that year in the 1870s. So Vedanaya Kampillai is one. The other is Divan Bahadur Raghunath Rao, who will later on go on to become Divan of two great princely states of India. And the third man I will come to shortly. But Vedanaya Kampillai becomes the district munsif of a place called Tarangampadi, which is near, uh, you know, all of us have been to Tirukadayur to observe somebody's 60th birthday or somebody's 70th birthday or somebody's 80th birthday. Just eight kilometers outside of Tirukadayur is this beautiful place called Tarangampadi. 
it's a danish town and uh, this is where the danes came to establish an east india company and they were not successful like the british and so they sold the entire town to the british and left and therefore in the 1870s a district municipal court was established over there and vedanai kampilai becomes the district municipal of that particular area later he gets transferred to mailaduthurai where he operates for some time then he becomes the chairman of the mailaduthurai municipality finally he retires from the post of district municipal but what we recognize him today for is that the first tamil novel prathapa mudaliyar charitram was written by vedanai kampilai in fact the second novel also was written by him in addition to that he composed a number of carnatic music songs this samuel vedanai kampilai and all his compositions carry his name vedanai in, in at least one line and contrary to what most people would expect it is a non denominational deity that he prays to he is not praying to a christian deity he is praying to a non denominational deity that anybody can pray to and right now we are going through a covid scare and you know we are all talking about the plight of the migrant labor and things like that in 1875 to 1877 we had a great famine in madras presidency and that is called the ishwara dhatu varada panjam it is one of the greatest famines uh, that ever occurred in indian history several million people died in that process and uh, many people began to migrate to the city in order to search for food vedanai kampilai was in the forefront and the imperial government in calcutta refused to recognize that there was a famine in madras in fact the viceroy came all lord lipton came all the way down to madras presidency he saw the people starving he saw the refugee camps and then he had the temerity to write a note that they are all well fed and lazy people who have no work and they have come here in order to seek free food and there is no reason why there should be any uh, aid given to madras presidency to solve this famine that is when the government of madras begins work on the buckingham canal because it becomes a work for food program so people who have come as refugees to the city they are asked to dig the canal and they are fed but in the meantime mayavaram mailaduthurai vedanayakam pillai in in mailaduthurai he organizes huge relief camps spending his own money collecting money from other people and there was a great composer at that time by the name of gopalakrishna bharathi who writes the nandanar charitram he composes a song on vedanayakam pillai where he says niye purusha meru you are that meru mountain that gives everything that people desire vedanai kampile is buried in mailaduthurai and this is a photograph of his tombstone i mean of the memorial stone that fronts his tomb i have actually personally gone and taken this photograph myself vedanai kampile has composed songs on the judiciary on the way the courts work on the way poi sakshi solradhu eppadi how to get people <laughs> to uh, give false witness about corruption in the judiciary it's amazing that somebody in the 1880s is addressing a lot of social problems in a particular profession in the mode of songs and uh, he's uh, he's very satirical about his own profession and uh, he says that uh, the lame man stands accused of having kicked a ma- a another person the blind man says that he saw the whole incident the deaf man says that he heard the screams of the injured party and the son who is born to a barren woman he is the one who has come to the court to file this particular suit so this is the description that uh, vedanai kampilai writes in one of his one of the songs concerning the judiciary but anyway we will proceed further i mentioned to you that you know three people wrote that examination of the district munsif i mean three people qualified in that examination of the district munsif one was divan bahadur ragunath rao the second was uh, vedanaya kampile the third was sarti muthuswami ayer tiruvarur muthuswami ayer whose statue all of you in the high court have an opportunity to see because it is right there right in the first floor of the high court this huge marble statue and i always find it very interesting that people actually place flowers at the feet of this statue and for them it is somehow a symbol of justice 
and uh, Muthuswami Iyer Bridge is the bridge that eventually leads to the High Court. When we are going down from Beach Road, we cross Muthuswami Bridge, which is just next to the Fort Station, and then from there we go on to uh, Raja Annamalai Mandram. After Annamalai Mandram, we take a left. And then there we are in front of the High Court. So the bridge is named after him, the first Indian to become a judge of the Madras High Court. And uh, very interesting, of course, his life probably requires a separate presentation by itself. But some of the very interesting things, for the first time, uh, the British I have to understand that there is a judge who is now going to travel by the first class compartment. And there is this very apocryphal story of Mulsami Iyer boarding a train in Egmore and uh, putting his turban and his shoe and his walking stick by his side and going to sleep. Englishman comes and realizes that there is a blackie who is sleeping in the same compartment, gets very offended, takes the turban of Mutsuami Ayer and his walking stick and flings them out of the running train. Next day, like a good, you know, a good South Indian gets up at four in the morning. So Mutsuami Ayer gets up early in the morning, finds his turban and walking stick are missing. So realizes that who's responsible for it. So picks up the shoes of the Englishman and flings them out of the train. So next day, when the Englishman wakes up eventually, he is, where are my shoes? And he says, they've gone in search of my turban and my walking stick. And eventually, when they are found, they will all come back together. So this was T. Uh, Mutswami Ayer, no ordinary walkover kind of a personality. What is very interesting about his cultural influence is that he is probably the first judge. He is the first Indian judge. And he is also the first legal luminary who takes a great interest in the propagation of classical music. So at that time, they form a sabha called the Madras Jubilee Gayana Samaj. The Jubilee word is to commemorate Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee in 1887. And uh, so they name it the Madras Jubilee Gayana Samaj. And they invite Englishmen and the aristocracy of Madras to come every Saturday to listen to classical music performances. So the governor of Madras and his lady, the commander in chief of the Madras army and his lady, judges of the high court, other prominent worthies of Madras, they will all come to what was, what is even now there just opposite the high court, the Pachepas Hall. You, you, I'm sure all of you have seen it, that Greek colored yellow building, which is crumbling and falling down. That is where these performances would happen. Muthuswami Iyer would read out a paper for the benefit of the English to explain to them what is this performance that is going to happen after this, what are the nuances of this particular presentation, who are the musicians, what is it that they are going to do. So this is the first example of an Indian explaining a, an Indian art, a wholly classical Indian art to a Western audience and getting them to understand what it is all about. And it is happening in the 1880s. And uh, the patron of this organization, I'm sure he would have never had an opportunity to ever come here. But Prince Alfred, the Duke of Connaught, Queen Victoria's son, was the patron of the Madras Jubilee Gaya and Samaj. And proceedings of the Gaya and Samaj were documented and sent to him regularly so that he would know what these people were doing in distant Madras city. So this was really the first Sabha of the city. It began with the blessings of a judge of the Madras High Court. So that is really the starting point of a great and a very long cultural influence. Now in the 1880s, Tamil theatre or any theatre for that matter was considered to be a very vulgar, uh, you know, art form that people of a certain quality would not want to go and see. Uh, most of the artists would be drunk, men and women would act together and a lot of the dialogues would be ad-libbed. There'd be a lot of vulgarity that they would exchange on stage. And uh, the audience that came would love that kind of thing and they would cheer and they'd be cries for once more and all that. So, so-called refined society would not go and attend these performances. So at that time, two very uh, kind of coeval uh, phenomena, influences happened. The first was a person called Shankarada Swamigal, who was a playwright. He said the reason why Tamil drama is so vulgar is because men and women act together. And secondly, we are dealing with adults. So now we will have only boys, young boys acting in our place. I will write the script and we will have lots of songs, classical songs. And so the boys company, in fact, all the political stalwarts of the later era, they would all come from the boys company. Tamil cinema as well as the uh, Tamil politics. So you name it Shivaji Ganeshan. 
എം ജി രാമചന്ദ്രൻ എസ് എസ് രാജേന്ദ്രൻ എം കെ രാധ എം ആർ രാധ എവ്രിബഡി വുഡ് കം ഫ്രം ദ ബോയ്സ് കമ്പനി ദേ വർ ഓൾ ഗോയിങ് ടു കം ഫ്രം ദാറ്റ് കോ ഇൻസിഡന്റ്ലി അറ്റ് ദ സെയിം ടൈം എ യങ് ലോയർ കോൾ പമ്മൽ സമന്ദ് മുതലിയാർ ഹു ഹാസ് ജസ്റ്റ് ഗ്രാജുവേറ്റഡ് ഇൻ ലോ ഹി ഈസ് ഇൻവൈറ്റഡ് ബൈ എ ഫ്രണ്ട് ടു ഗോ ആൻഡ് വിറ്റ്നെസ് എ കന്നഡ പ്ലേ and he says i i don't think i am interested at all because i know how bad these dramas can be they tell him no no you must come and see kannada theater is something very different there is a group that has come from bellari and they are going to act it out so pamal samand mudaliyar goes to witness this play and he likes it so much that he decides that he is going to reform tamil theater his own way which is just as shankaradas swamigal forms a troop of young boys he is going to form a troop of graduates because he says university graduates who have all had a certain amount of education they will not you know be vulgar or base in their thinking we will have very refined and you know uh, high brow plays he also did not like music so he said our theater will not have music we will have fantastic dialogues and so they form what is called the suguna vilasa sabha in the 1880s and almost every lawyer of the madras high court indian vakil who was in the madras high court becomes a member of suguna vilasa sabha and they operate from this building which you see on the side which is the victoria public hall and on this side this is photograph of kamal samadh mudaliyar himself he was going to have a very long life he was going to live practically till his 90s and initially where do you get the plays from there is only one playwright william shakespeare so you take all his plays and you translate them into tamil so romeo juliet becomes jwalita ramanan macbeth becomes magapati merchant of venice becomes vani pura vanigan hamlet becomes amala adityan cymbeline becomes sarasangi virimbiya vidame which is as you like it so all of these are translated and they are acted out initially then samand mudaliyar becomes a fine playwright himself writes several plays for the suguna vilasa sabha and eventually there even comes a belief that if you don't join the suguna vilasa sabha you cannot rise in law if you want to become a judge if you want to become a top ranking lawyer you have to become a member of the suguna vilasa sabha and men and women there was no question of women only men would play the role of men and women see this entire cast of the suguna vilasa sabha taken in 1895 you can see all those women are actually men the, those wonderful ladies in sarees and long braids there is a ranga vadivelu mudaliyar who was known for his acting of women's roles and he was also a lawyer of the madras high court and uh, every governor who came a welcoming party was always organized at suguna vilasa sabha farewell to the governor would be organized at the suguna vilasa sabha if they did not like the governor they would not give him a farewell at the suguna vilasa sabha just like the bar association will not accord a farewell to a retiring judge if they do not like his policies similarly in those days you expressed your displeasure by not giving a farewell to a governor like lord pentland people like that were not liked and so they refused on the other hand an earthquake in bihar and they would have fundraising by the suguna vilasa sabha and then Navaratri celebrations at the Victoria Public Hall were very famous. All the lawyers would dress in sarees as heroines from the Suguna Vilasa Sabha plays and the lawyers of Madras and their wives would be invited and Vetalapakke and Manjal would be given to all the ladies by these mangalis who are all men actually <laughs> in drag. So this is how Suguna Vilasa Sabha in its time was perhaps the greatest cultural influence on Madras city. You name the lawyer VC Gopal Ratnam V. V. Srinivasa Iyengar, Satya Murthy, Pamal Samand Mudaliyar, everybody was a member of this particular cultural organization. Samand Mudaliyar himself finally becomes a judge of the small causes court, as we all know. At this time, some lawyers chose to give up the law because they were not very comfortable with the profession. And one of them was Shiva Shankar Pandya, a Gujarati who came to Madras, started practicing in law and then gave up and decided that education would be his forte. founds the hindu theological school where mahatma gandhi has come um, swami vivekananda has come and spoken over here the reason why i am bringing this up is that shivashankar pandya dies early and then he is succeeded by yet another man who gave up law to take to education kuruchi rangasamy ayengar who uh, becomes a principal of the hindu theological school later becomes the correspondent of the lady shivaswami ayer girls school in mailapur 
And the reason why I'm bringing, bringing him here is today we talk about this noon meal scheme, which we say completely transformed Tamil Nadu by bringing a huge chunk of school going children into the schools, educated them eventually when the IT revolution and all happened, there was a huge educated database of educated base of children who could take to IT as a profession. So the first person who thinks of this noon meal scheme is Ayodhya Das Pandizar, the Dalit leader. That was in the early 1900s when he invites Dalit students to come to school because he realizes that by feeding them, they will then stay on and get educated. The man who takes it to the next level is Kuruchi Rangasamy Ayengar and he introduces it in the Hindu Theological School. Once he introduces it here, Mayor Sundara Rao Naidu, who is the mayor of Madras, introduces it in a couple of schools meant for Adi Dravidas, which is what we would, the old name for the Dalits. Then Kamraj takes it forward and introduces it in several of the schools. Finally, MGR takes it across the state when there is a critical mass. So a lawyer thinks differently, starts a noon meal scheme, taking it from Ayodhya Das Pandita's idea. And that is the seed from which this entire noon meal scheme is going to grow bigger. Then we have yet another lawyer, P.S. Pennathur Subramanyayar, who becomes the Advocate General of the Government of Madras and dies very early because of rheumatoid arthritis. This is a mandapam that none of you will get to see. This is in the northernmost corner of the Mailapur Kapalishwarar temple tank. It is inside the tank compound. And all the Tasmac sachets and the beer bottles and the liquor bottles are thrown here. This is a repository for that. But this is a fountain that P.S. Sivaswami Iyer, no, Pennathur Subramani Iyer constructed to commemorate the Golden Jubilee of Queen Victoria because he was a municipal councillor of Mailapur ward at that time. Later, he becomes the Advocate General. When he dies, P.S. Charities is set up. And as you know, we have several schools today under that P.S. Charities, which are still being administered. We have V.C. Desika Charyar. And now we come to a unique family, like medicine, like business, we have these legal families where, you know, my grandfather was so-and-so, my father was so-and-so, I am so-and-so, my children are also in law. So fourth generation, fifth generation. So we have what is called the Vambakam family, V-A-M-B-A-C-C-A-M at that time, Vambakam. But actually it's Vambakam, which is a lake somewhere in the Tengalpet or somewhere in that area. Several lawyers would come out and out of this family. So you had V.C. Desika Charyar and V.C. Sesha Charyar. Then we had Sir V. Bhashti Mahinga. We had V.V. Srinivasa Ega. We had V.C. Gopal Ratnam. Then we had yet another V. Bhashti Mahinga who became a judge of the Madras, small causes court in Madras. So we had several of them. Sesha Charyar's portrait you see over here. And Sesha Charyar is the man who begins what is known as the Madras Law Weekly. Even now brought out from South Mada Street in that same house, Vasanta Vilas which still stands. You can see this. This is the only portion of Vasanta Vilas that is still standing. The rest of it has been much modernized, but you can see the sign code also over there, which says Law Weekly. Today, when you talk about Mailapur, you talk about the Sabhas of Mailapur. But till, the, uh, till 1905, 1906, there was no Sabha in Mailapur. All the Sabhas were in Georgetown. The man who begins the Sabha in Mailapur is from B.C. Sheshacharya's family and they call it the Sharada Sangeeta Sabha. That is the first Sabha of Mailapur area which was hosted in their house. This is where all the music performances would happen. In 1911, when King George V was crowned the King Emperor, they announced a competition among musicians to compose a song on King George V. And Ramanathapuram Puchi Srinivas Iyengar composes a song Satatamu Brovu Maya Chakravartini in, um, in Raga Todi. And he gets a gold medal in this house for having done that particular composition. Today, of course, there is no trace of that music sabha, but it must have been a great organization when it functioned. One of the family members was Sarvi Bhashi Mayengar, whose statue, as you know, is just outside in the High Court compound. V. Bhashi Mayengar, the first Indian to become the Advocate General of the, of the High Court of Madras, later becomes a judge of the Madras High Court and then resigns because he says that his income as a lawyer was far higher than what it was as that of a judge. And he could not maintain his family in the style to which they were accustomed <laughs> on a judge's salary. And so he quits and becomes and continues to practice in the same court, which raises a big question, which is why 
Legislation is then brought in which prevents a judge from practicing in the same court in which he was originally sitting in judgment. And there is this famous story of Bashi Mayingar having stepped down as judge and arguing once again. And V. Krishnaswamy Iyer is his opponent in a particular case and quotes one of Bashi Mayingar's judgments against Bashi Mayingar in that particular argument. When Bashi Mayingar in retaliation says, Oh, that was a different era. All that is obiter. That doesn't matter any longer. And then presents his counter. This interesting personality, as you know, always wanted to die with his boots on in the High Court of Madras. And that is given to him, finally. He is arguing in the, in the Chief Justice's court. When he has a stroke, he reels out and collapses at the foot of Sarti Muthuswami Iyer's statue and then is taken out and that is how he dies. He was given to him to die with his boots on, arguing a case. Now, Bashi Mayengar lived in what is today Kamadenu Theatre. That is the theatre, but originally there was a house there called Lakshmi Vilas. It was not a very big house, only 100 grounds. Each ground, as you know, is 2,400 square feet. Not a very big property. And uh, that is where the family lived. They had their own tank. They had their own performance space. They had everything. And that is where plenty of music performances, Harikatha performances have happened. The very interesting thing was that his son-in-law would become even greater. Sriman Srinivas Ayengar, who would also eventually become Advocate General of the Government of Madras, of the High Court of Madras. Uh, Sriman Srinivas Ayengar was a man of severe short temper and everybody in the family was terrified of it. In fact, later on when he joins the Congress party and becomes a freedom fighter, somebody goes and asks his wife, why is it that you have not taken to participating in the freedom struggle? She says, there is nothing more difficult than managing my husband and I consider that my duty. The rest of these small matters like fighting for the country's independence and all you people can take care of. So if the father-in-law lived in a hundred ground property, the son-in-law had to do better. So he acquired a property on Lush Church Road for 150 grounds and that was called Amjad Bagh. Today there is an entire housing colony in Amjad Bagh. The house doesn't exist any longer. But it was a family that was going to face a lot of tragedy. And uh, the, the son died by switching on a radio during a thunderstorm. Lightning struck the house and he was electrocuted and killed. Yet another son suffered from polio. The daughter whose photo you see over here is Ambu Jamal, the freedom fighter. What happens when you have a daughter and you live in a 150 ground house and you're a multi-millionaire and you look for a son-in-law from an orthodox Iyengar family? You pick up the first idiot you can find in a one-room tenement in Kumbakonam in a maha-orthodox family and you bring him and get married to your daughter. What does he do after impregnating your daughter? He goes mad because he cannot live in a 150 ground house where trees are howling in the night. Nobody comes. Father-in-law is a man of high temper. He becomes a lunatic. So Ambu Jamal is left a very unhappy woman. Then Mahatma Gandhi comes to the house. They all become, they, overnight they get converted to Gandhis. And they become freedom fighters. And Ambu Jamal wants to go to prison. That is her ambition. She wants to go to jail. There is her mother's sister, Janamal, who has abandoned her husband years ago. And she also wants to go to jail. Every day, jail is on day. Gandhi is told you, jail is going So they all go and they picket all the shops on NSC Bos Road, along with all the other Congress workers. Everybody else is arrested except these two and they are escorted back home. They wonder why. Then they get to realize when your father is Advocate General, you can't be arrested. Right? So they finally tell the father, have you done something to prevent our arrest? He says, yeah, I have already given a submission that my daughter is of me unsound mentally. Therefore, you cannot arrest an unsound, mentally unsound person. So then this woman goes on a hunger strike. Gandhi has taught them that. So we'll go on a hunger strike. So unless you allow permission for me to go to prison, I will starve unto death. So after three days, father gives in and says, you can do whatever you want. You go to prison. So they go to prison. They fight on Gandhi's behalf. Then they come back. And then they found what is known as Srinivasa Gandhi Nilayam, which is on Abdul Jamal Street even today. It's an organization for the uplift of women who will learn skills and then contribute usefully to society. 
And in front of that Srinivasa Gandhi Nilayam, there is a small Tulasi Madam with a Tulasi growing in it. Inside that Tulasi Madam, in the soil, there is a copper pot which contains a small bit of Mahatma Gandhi's ashes. When Gandhi was cremated in 1948, Ambu Jamal requests that some ash should be sent to her. She places it in that copper pot and buries it in that Tulasi Madam. That organization is named as Srinivasa Gandhi Nilayam because she says, one man gave birth to me and that is Sriman Srinivasa in that. The other man was my spiritual father, Mahatma Gandhi. So that is how that organization is named Srinivasa Gandhi Nilayam. We have Sir Chettu Shankaran Nayar. The whole of Mahalingapuram at one time was one house and that was a house called Linwood, which is why even today we have a street there called Linwood Avenue. So Chetru Shankaran Nair was a judge of the Madras High Court. Now why do I bring him into this particular presentation? At one time, women who participated in the classical arts were all Devadasis. You, if, you were, if you came from an upper caste family and you were a woman who wanted to practice music or dance, you were not allowed to do so. Any woman who got on to stage was considered a Devadasi. Now, somewhere somebody has to break the rule. So there is a Brahmin girl called C. Saraswati Bai who wants to do a Harikatha performance. And at that time, Shankar Nair's wife is running an organization called the Egmore Ladies Recreation Club. That is where Saraswati Bai is given the first opportunity to perform a Harikatha. People yell abuse at her, then she is branded as a prostitute. They are told, people are told that if you encourage this woman to give one more performance, we will ostracize anybody who does it. Shankar Nair and his wife are the people who fight against it. And they go around recommending the name of Saraswati Bai for performances. That is how today, if you have a number of non-Devadasi women artists today performing, it is because of what Saraswati Bai did and what Shankar Nair and his wife did to encourage her. We come to V. Krishnaswami Iyer. Several organizations and institutions were founded by him. The Mailapur Club, the Sanskrit College, the Venkatramana Ayurveda Dispensary, Indian Bank. He was in his time the greatest lawyer. Finally, he becomes a judge of the High Court of Madras, becomes a member of the Governor's Executive Council. In 1911, he goes to Delhi because it is the grand coronation Darbar and King George V has come. And he is going to be presented with the order of the commander of the Indian Empire. The silk sash that they put on him cuts his stomach. And he is heavily diabetic and it turns septic in a matter of days. He comes back to Madras and dies within a week. And he was not even 50 at that time. This man, at one time, he and Subramanya Bharati did not see eye to eye with each other because he was a moderate in Indian politics, whereas Subramanya Bharati was a radical. And yet, one day, Uve Swaminatha here, Tamil Tata, recites a few poems of Subramanya Bharati to Krishna Swami Iyer. Krishna Swami Iyer is so moved by the songs that he says, who is it that has composed it? And Tamil Tata says that he's not a person whom you really like, it's Subramanya Bharati with whom you are totally against. But he says, that doesn't matter, please invite him to come home. So Subramanya Bharati is invited home and Krishna Swami Iyer funds the first publication of Subramanya Bharati's poems. Three poems are published and Sendamir Nadenum Podi Nile is one of them and they are distributed free of cost to the public. It was because of him that that particular act happens and that is how Bharati, the first instance of Bharati's works coming into print, it happens because of V. Krishna Swami Iyer. P.S. Sivaswami Iyer, who becomes Advocate General later, well-known story, P.S. Swami Sivaswami Salai commemorates him. The Amalgamations Bangalore, Sudharma, which is there next to Woodlands Hotel, that was P.S. Sivaswami Iyer's house, five acres, the property. And he and Lady Sivaswami Iyer had no children. And he decided that, you know, most people bequeath everything to charity after they die. This couple decided that they would rather do it when they are alive. So when his wife died, even when, they were, when she was alive, he began to take a lot of interest in a school called the National Girls School, which is in Mailapur. And also in a school in his own village, Tirukattapalli. And he began to donate a lot of money to both the institutions. When his wife died, he sold his entire house and moved into a two-room house on Sentabaz Avenue. Had a cook 
whom he nominated to do his final kriyas and said and left behind some money for the cook and the rest of the money was all bequeathed to those two schools that is why the school in mailapur is even today known as the lady sivaswami arier girl school in commemoration of his wife and his acts of charity now let's it, life is just not the top ranking translators and the high court judges and the lawyers and all that so we have some of the junior functionaries you had a translator in the high court of madras called koti swaraiya he was an expert in sanskrit tamil and english and when he retired in the 1920s he became he came from a great musical lineage his grandfather was kavi kunjara bharati a great poet and musician and he decided that he would compose songs in all the 72 mother ragas of carnatic music we call them the mela karta ragas so these are the ragas where all the seven notes are there in the ascending scale and in the descending scale 41 of them are considered to be dissonant ragas so there is a there was a feeling that these were inauspicious ragas and you are not supposed to sing in them people would only sing in the remaining ragas he was the man who corrected that he composed in every one of those 72 ragas published it as a book called kandagana for them and people then began to realize that even those vivadi ragas are very beautiful and they began to sing them and today they have become a part of the mainstream of classical music if koteshwar ayer was a translator we also had retamalai srinivasan who was also a translator he later on goes on to become goes on to south africa where he becomes very close to mahatma gandhi he is the great dalit leader and reformer who brings out the magazine called the parayan and later on works very hard for the uplift of the backward castes and three people ayodhya das panditar retamalai srinivasan retamalai srinivasan incidentally was ayodhya das panditar's brother in law and mc raja these were the three people who really begin what is the reformation movement as far as tamil nadu is concerned and the long battle for social inclusivity after that we have people like periyar we have anna durai and all that and most people today only recognize history from that point but these were all the forerunners of that movement without these people they would not have been able to come then we have sir mutta venkat subarao and lady andal venkat subarao sir mutta who was a lawyer mutta venkat subarao and radha krishnaiya which was a very famous firm of solicitors at one point of time then venkat subarao becomes a judge of the high court he marries a child widow andalamma as his second wife they were from the arya vaisya community what we would originally would be called as the komuti chetti community and they had no children much of their wealth would go to social charities like the madras seva sadhan and the mutta venkat subarao school which is in tinagar and the lady andal venkat subarao school which is in harrington road all of these would come out of their wealth and they would give new life to several people we also had lawyers who sang you see in this photograph this is ariyakodi ramanu jayengar singing at the tiruvayar aaradhana this is papa k s venkatramaya the violinist behind that wearing glasses and a banyan is k s jayaram ayer who was one of the most prominent criminal lawyers on the criminal side of the high court of madras he is singing the pancharatnams at the tiruvayar tyagaraja aaradhana sitting behind all the prominent musicians and this is his wife alamelu jayaramayer who was the first woman to run a sabha before that no woman had ever run one and she was running it venkatesha bhakta jana sabha which was in georgetown and when they died it was their dearest wish that their house should be sold to somebody who would keep to keep the musical interests of the property going now how do you get a buyer like that you can't get anybody who will promise to keep the musical interests going finally the bharatiya vidya bhavan gets very interested in that particular property and how does the bharatiya vidya bhavan buy such a large house they don't have the money anantramakrishnan of amalgamations gives the money and the house is bought it is demolished the bharatiya vidya bhavan auditorium which is on east mada street is where jera mayer and alamelu lived and even today every day there is a music performance that is going on in that particular building and what is more is that bharatiya vidya bhavan does not sell tickets the music performance is open to everybody which is what alamelu wanted she wanted people to be able to come and listen somehow her wish came true and it has continued ever since 
T.M. Krishnaswamy Iyer, who was known as Tirupugal Mani, uh, who was, they, he lived on Rayapata High Road, just next to the Vidya Mandir school in a huge bungalow called Bala Vilas. He was one of the top, in, at one time it was believed that if you had to be successful in Madras High Court as a lawyer, your name had to be Krishnaswamy. Because three Krishnaswamis cornered all the practice, Alladi Krishnaswamy Iyer, T.M. Krishnaswamy Iyer and K.V. Krishnaswamy Iyer. And it was said that all three of them enrolled at roughly the same time in a, in a particular year. And so TMK was, a, was very well known on the criminal side. Later, he becomes the chief justice of the Travancore High Court and then retires from there and comes back and then continues his practice. TMK is known as Tirupugal Mani because he gave fresh impetus to the singing of Tirupugal. In fact, the humorist SVV in his articles on Mailapur, he would write, Mailapur is full of lawyers who in the evening would wear Vibhuti and Rudraksham and begin singing while their wives will have, will wear spectacles and drive cars and go and play tennis in saris. So this was SVV, the humorous description of Mailapur of that era. TMK was the man whom he had in mind because every evening they would have Tirupugal Bhajan in their house and the Mahapariva of Kansi gave him the title Tirupugal Mani. It is very interesting that his initials were TM which is Tiruvadi Muttannaraya Krishnasamy Iyer, but it became Tirupugal Mani Krishnasamy Iyer. And he started a new practice among lawyers, which he said was that every year on January 1st, all of you go and meet all the judges of the Madras High Court and greet them. What is the point in meeting all these earthly English judges who will one day vanish? On the other hand, you must go and meet the great judge who is forever watching over all that we do. So he said, come to Tirutani on December 31st, let us begin singing the Tirupugal at in the evening. By midnight, we will reach the top of the hill. So this became a huge practice and lakhs of people would go to join Tirupugal Mani to sing the Tirupugals on December 31st. They will start at a particular time. At every step, they will sing one Tirupugal. And there are 360 steps. By the time they reach the top, it will be New Year's Day. Finally, the railways began to run a special train between Madras and Tirutani on New Year's Eve to take the people who are going to sing along with Tirupugal Mani. This was the influence of this one man. Satyamurti, we all know. Satyamurti, the freedom fighter who became mayor of Madras and who died because of imprisonment during the Quit India movement. If he had lived, Rajaji would have had no place in Indian politics. He would have been the Congress leader. He would have become the chief minister of Madras and all that. Satyamurti, you see here as he was, here you see him acting as Manohara in Suguna Vilasa Sabha. And Satyamurti is also the man because of whom we still have water in Madras. We had some Red Hills reservoir. It was he who said we need one more reservoir at least in the city to quench the thirst of the people. And he kept pestering for it continuously. The government was not willing. Finally, in 1939, he becomes the mayor of Madras. Then he convinces the governor that we need a new reservoir to be built. The Pundi reservoir work starts when he was mayor. And because he was mayor, he had to go for the foundation stone laying ceremony. The Congress party protests. Rajaji writes to the high command in Delhi saying that he is unpatriotic because he is joining with the governor. He replies saying that I am first a resident of Madras whose thirst I have to quench. And after that, I am a congressman and everything else. And so he goes, he gets the work started on the reservoir. By the time it's completed, he is dead. Then independence comes. The question is, whom do you name this reservoir after? Everybody wants it named after Satyamurti. Rajaji says, no, it is not possible to name it after him. But Kamraj leads a protest because Kamraj was a Satyamurti devotee. For him, whatever Ayer did was good. And finally, it is named as Satyamurti Sagar. Even today, much of the water that we get in this city comes from the Pundi Reservoir. It is thanks to the vision of this particular man. Satyamurti was not just a lawyer. He was not just a freedom fighter. He was not a playwright. He was a great man in music. And he was one of the founders of the Music Academy in 1927. Here you see the first meeting of the Music Academy in 1928. After, at its inauguration, Sir C.P. Ramaswamy Iyer, another great lawyer of Madras, anything that he inaugurated would do well. And that has happened. Music Academy has lived on for 90 years and is going doing great guns, probably because of the man who inaugurated it. Satyamurti is absent in this picture. And why is he absent? Because he was in prison for freedom fighting. 
in fact the needs of the music academy is our secretary is not available at this moment he is fulfilling a jail sentence so that's why satyamurthy is not here but this is the inaugural photograph several lawyers would contribute to the well being of the music academy and i'll just i'm coming towards the end of the presentation the second president of the music academy was this man k v krishna swami iyer i told you about three krishna swamis aladi krishna swami iyer tm krishna swami iyer k v k k v k was a man of severe short temper he sued the kapaleeshwara temple because the bell ringing of the bell was disturbing him in the mornings when he was wanting to focus on the cases of the day and then when he lost the case he built a mandabam in expiation for what he had done he said i did the wrong thing by by filing a suit against the kapaleeshwara temple so he built a mandabam for it he was a member of the university syndicate there was a strong theory that he would become vice chancellor of the university but he suffered from parkinson's disease very early and that put an end to his legal career because after some time his speech and all began to slur but he was also president of the music academy for 30 years between 1935 and 1965 he was the president all the practices that the music academy continued thereafter is because of kvk and his team of assistants like kasturi srinivasan of the hindu dr v raghavan t l venkatramaiyar everybody worked with kvk there are many stories about kvk but i'll be very quick kvk was the man who made academy's punctuality a byword no matter who the artist is if they don't finish on time you have to drop the curtains you cannot let people just continue performing punctuality was absolutely important we still follow it we are abused for it we are shouted at people say we have no respect for the artists but time keeping is important and everybody knows how long they have to perform they don't have an excuse for going on after that secondly he was the man who said anybody who comes in has to have a ticket you don't come in free because this is an organization that needs to make money to pay its artists needs money to continue functioning carnatic music is not a charity so alladi krishna swami iyer once wandered in nobody could stop the advocate general coming in next day he got a debit note from kvk saying that this is the money you have to pay for the ticket for the performance that you came yesterday alladi paid that was alladi kvk is also father of the library movement in madras what is called the madras library association and today is known as the local library authority he is the man who started it and said if people in tamil nadu have to be educated they need to read books people can't afford to read books government's job is to fulfill that by taking books around so in kumbakonam they began a mobile library on a bullock cart it would go from street to street people would become members books would be given gradually it came to a stage where every district even today in tamil nadu has a library this is the only state in the whole country where every district has a library and this was the man who started it his assistant was the father of library science sr ranganathan who was then working in the madras university sr ranganathan had a small system of codification of library books which is known as the colon system kvk recognized its genius and said write a book on the classification of, of library books it became an international system and today all over the world books are classified as per ranganathan's colon classification system if kvk had not been there for getting it done nobody would have recognized the genius of sr ranganathan sr ranganathan all over the world is considered the father of library science even today it's thanks to kvk kvk was so passionately attached to the music academy that he had to die during the december music season in december 1965 he passed away his death was announced during a concert of semangudi srinivas iyer and the academy's performance was stopped on that day in deference to the president who had been at the helm of affairs for 30 years his assistant was bashir ahmed said wherever kvk went bashir would follow music academy bashir was the longest serving vice president of the music academy in 1979 or 80 he had completed whatever 50 years or something as a committee member of the music academy local library authority he was a member along with kvk whatever kvk did bashir ahmed said would do and bashir ahmed said had only one principle if an institution has to survive it has to have real estate if you don't have real estate if you are going to pay rent and you are going to depend on the charity of someone else that's it you forget it all your work will die after some point of time music academy in 1945 had collected some amount of money 
they had identified one ground in Thiruvallikeni, which they wanted to buy as their property. Vashishthir got to know about it and laughed and said, you are a national institution. Are you going to build an institution on 2,400 square feet? There is, on the other hand, a huge property of 27 grounds that is coming up for sale on Edward Elliott's road. You buy it. You know how the Tambrans are, right? You imagine taking a loan and all that. Everybody's hands will tremble. They will die thousand deaths. Khadan Wangina, Adalai, So he said, nothing doing. Take a loan. Go and borrow from the banks. What is the point in having people like T.T. Krishnamachari and Kasturi Srinivasan and all on your committee if on their security you cannot borrow money? So finally, they swallowed their shame and everything. They went and they borrowed money. Bashir Ahmed Saeed is the man who signed the property purchase document of the Music Academy. Without, can you imagine such a large auditorium today in one ground in Thiruvallikeni? Is it even possible? It was his vision. Similarly, when he, started, when he joined New College, he ensured that that property of New College. When he fought with New College and then started the South Indian Education Trust and founded the SIET College, he ensured that that huge property on Tenampet was purchased for it and several schools would come up on the same thing. It's, this man was an absolute genius. There is no other <laughs> word for him. Every day when I step into the Music Academy for a committee meeting, I think of Bashir Ahmed Saeed only. I don't think of anyone else. Without him, no auditorium. Without no auditorium, no Music Academy. Anyway, now we come to the tail end of the presentation. Some great musicians and musicologists were lawyers, but they never practiced. To quote V.C. Gopal Ratnam, they were not on speaking terms with the High Court of Madras. The first among these was T.V. Subarao, who was a zamindar of Aska, which is somewhere in, in the, uh, you know, the border areas between Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. And he was the first secretary of the Music Academy. We are all his heirs, so to speak. And he ran the conferences of the Music Academy between 1928 and his death sometime in the 1950s. You know, Academy has got a system of recognizing one musician every year with the title of Sangeetha Kalani. T.V. Subarao was the first Kalani. He was asked to preside over the annual music conference of the first music conference of the Academy in 1929. Till date, he remains the youngest Kalanidhi. He was only 37 years old. And that is a record that nobody else has been able to beat after that. T.L. Venkatram Ayer, who was for long a committee member of the Music Academy, who later became a judge of the Federal Court and no, of the Supreme Court of India. He is also a Sangeetha Kalanidhi. He is the only judge of the Madras High, of the High Court who is all, I mean, uh, who is only, he was the only judge who is also a Sangeetha Kalanidhi. A great authority on the Kritis of Muthuswami Dikshitar, the guru of D.K. Patamal. And finally, in 1962, when the Music Academy celebrated its centenary, he gave the concert for it. Justice uh, S. Ramchandrayar, who was then the Chief Justice, said that only T.L. Venkatramayar can give a performance, accompanied by V.P. Raman on the violin, Srivat Samani on the Mridangam, and Sriram's grandfather, I think, was it on the Gatam? Who was it? The fourth musician. Not your family. Somebody, I forget who, uh, the fourth lawyer. Everybody was a legal uh, luminary in that particular concert. I forget who the fourth per person was. Memory failed me. Professor Sambamurti, today all Carnatic music syllabuses in every college and school and university where music is taught, we follow Professor Sambamurti's textbooks. He was also a man who was qualified in law. Justice M. Anantha Narayanan, Chief Justice of the Madras High Court, he wrote Carnatic music compositions as well. He is probably the only judge on whom an English poet wrote a poem. Because when his book was published, the poet John Abdike saw the name Ananta Narayanan and said so many A's and so many N's in one name, it's impossible. And so he wrote a poem, though authors are a dreadful clan, to be avoided if you can, I would like to meet the Indian M. Ananta Narayanan. I pictured him as short and tan, we would meet perhaps in Hindustan, I'd say with admirable Elan, ah Ananta Narayanan. I have heard of you, the times once ran, a notice on your novel, an unusual tale, God and man. And Ananta Narayanan would seat me on a lush divan and read his name that spells quite a span of A's and N's 
in zanadu did kubla khan allowed to me all day i plan henceforth to be an ardent fan of m anantanarayana this is a poem that john updike wrote on anantanarayana sadly the two never met each other <laughs> they only knew of each other by proxy durga bai deshmukh was a practicing lawyer of the madras high court as well imagine this woman who created the andhra mahila sabha who uh, went on to become a member of the constituent assembly in delhi who was so influential in ensuring that several provisions in the constituent constitution relating to women were durga bai deshmukh's contributions and she was this lawyer who went from here all the way there and ended up marrying the finance minister government of india chintaman deshmukh she became durga bai deshmukh thereafter m subaraya ayer who founded several educational institutions top ranking income tax lawyer of the high court of madras three great institutions today owe their existence to the generosity of this man mit which is in krompet and then we have the vivekananda college and the vidyamandir school all three of them owe their existence to him etiraj who founded the etiraj college for women and endowed his house and his entire wealth to that particular college in 1948 even today scores of women come out of this center for excellence finally let's not forget cho ramaswamy how many of us have been awakened in political thought because of his place like nermai orangum neram unmaye un vilai enna madras by night he was a lawyer too we don't remember that because of all his other multifarious activities but he i think did bring quite a bit of his legal acumen into his writing and into his way he argued and presented his point of view and had numerous fans so this as i said this is only a selection this cannot be a comprehensive story on what all the lawyers have done or the judges have done this is just to give you a sample of what the high court of madras has produced thank you so very much ah uh, okay i'm 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 sure like me the very many people who uh, who who just died of laughter Uh, going your uh, unique way of uh, presenting x but i must uh, you know tell you that the topic was supposed to be in praise of lawyers and here you are having uh, having uh, rather uncharitable remarks about the yesteryear advocate generals and, <laughs> and the bar association <laughs> anyway it was it was hilarious to say the least huh? and uh, very frankly we didn't know too much about this uh, uh, we of course knew about the samuel vedanaikam pillai but not too much about this non denominational deity which would have which would have made him the right person to be around the supreme court when the review is being heard the <laughs> shabrimala case and uh, i we love the i mean i'm speaking on behalf of everybody we love the uh, the fact that uh, you know when referring to muthusami ayer you also had a nice dig at the englishman and the irony was that the dig was in english <laughs> so and this is not uh, you know exhaustive and only illustrative then um, when everybody is around i'm just making that request to you we be troubling you in future no not so often that it would be a, a nuisance but uh, just just so that uh, we come to know more about uh, our high court our history whether it is in terms of uh, music or educational institutions i'm sure a lot of these people like nl raja tk ram kumar murari who are all watching i have just seen them here and there i'm sure many of them have watched but i'm sure for many others it have been an eye opener thank much thank you so much for taking time off and to prepare this uh, screen uh, powerpoint presentation it was whether you enjoyed it or not i had a hilarious time it was so informative so entertaining and humorous at the same time thank you very much sri ram thank you thank you thank you yep yep and and we can get any questions from the bar association in the future <laughs> thank you thank you you bye 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 take care